Stretch. Let's get into some more Freedom Day analysis now. In the studio with me in Cape Town is Nick Moraine, political analyst at SOCGEN KD Securities. And in Johannesburg, we've got Kerwin Lebone, researcher at the SA Institute of Race Relations. Nick, uh, welcome to the show. And uh, Kerwin, I'll come to you in a moment. Uh, but uh, how do you, I think, how do you sort of describe freedom? And some people will say freedom is uh, the ability to be able to speak your mind. Some people say to put an X on a, on a, ballot, uh, a ballot sheet uh, during an election other people will say it's the ability to euthanize for example you go to Switzerland and you can assist your partner in, in suicide maybe just contextualize it for us hi Lindsay thank you uh, not Sokchen BNP Paribas KD Securities it's that's not, what I've it's got not on a my biggie. list that's a terrible thing to it's say BNP Paribas Joe Berg thank it's you not a biggie <laughs> uh, look I mean in South Africa it's, this has been an important debate and it continues to be an important debate um, the Freedom Charter defines in a whole lot of different ways um, and, and portrays quite a complex and nuanced idea of what freedom in, is. Of yeah. course freedom is about being able to t maximize your individual and personal choices, but I think in South Africa the point has been made very well. The freedom from want, the freedom to have a house over your head, the freedoms that come as you move away from pro poverty, the freedom that comes as a result of the adequate provision of, so pro provision of social services is as important as the freedom to, to, to say what you want, um, to, of movement, um, freedom from the, the, the classic oppression of the apartheid state. So I think economic freedoms, and I think a lot of the traction that Julius Malema mm. was able to get is because he articulated that so well. Economic freedom is as important as the cultural and ideological freedoms that come with our constitution or with, with those aspects of our constitution. Yes, of course, they all go together. Let's move now to Johannesburg. Uh, Cohen Leboni from the SA Institute of Race Relations is there. Cohen, thanks very much for, for joining us. So uh, over the last 19 years, are you happy uh, from a race relations aspect? Uh, yes, there have been impro uh, improvements. Uh, surveys have shown that um, race relations uh, between different population groups have improved uh, since after 1994, the first uh, multi-party democratic elections. So we are moving in the right directions, but there are challenges. Uh, uh, to give an example, uh, there is a case uh, against the Department of Correctional Services by the Titler Foundation and AfriForum. Uh, based on unfair treatment of uh, population groups that are not African. So we do have those kinds of challenges uh, and many people not being satisfied with the way PEE is being carried out. Uh, but on the whole, uh, there have been improvements, uh, the service show. Don't you think, though, Kerwin, that dissatisfaction is, is one thing, but we're being occasionally a little bit hard on ourselves. If you look at, say, for example, the last 100 years and you put it into context, what we've achieved over the last 19, we're still teenagers, as I said in my introduction. We can't expect everything to be turned around in such a short space of time. Most definitely. Uh, and in fact, uh, we've made the point uh, many times at the Institute that uh, uh, the delivery of basic uh, services to previously disadvantaged communities has been phenomenal. Uh, even the, even the, the ANC government itself has not believed it until we showed them the statistics that uh, the number of houses delivered to people, uh, people with access to water other than borehole taps within 200 meters of their households and even inside their households. And, uh, uh, bucket toilets um, are virtually being eradicate, eradicated. Uh, that, that will be so in the next two years. So there has been a lot, in, even in crime, uh, which we have the highest crime rate, uh, one of the highest crime rates in the world. But if you look at the long-term trends uh, between 1994 and uh, the last financial year, uh, the murder rate, for example, has, has dropped by, f by over 50 percent, and the overall crime rate has dropped by 70 percent. So there have been improvements, uh, and like you say, we are being hard on ourselves. I guess we've set ourselves high standards, and that might, uh, the dissatisfaction might stem from that fact. Very good. Nick, what do you think? We do set ourselves high standards, but it's always good to, to aim high. Where have we failed over the last 19 years? I will ask, answer where I think we failed over the last 19 years, but um, I think we do set ourselves high standards in the sense that we have one of the most sophisticated constitutional frameworks and dispensations, um, uh, institutions that protect and defend our, our, our human rights and our freedoms that have 
functioned extremely effectively and continue to do so. And the trends in those institutions around the Constitution that the Constitution gives effect to, I think, are excellent, despite the debate in the, uh, around the Judicial Services Commission, which is, I think, a tr intrinsically a necessary South African debate. But we've failed. There's no question about it. Um, there's, uh, I think, for example, um, you can track a, a tendency from the from the Thabo Mbeki's government, where, where um, uh, parts of the state institution, particularly the prosecutorial authority, the National Intelligence Services, um, uh, were used very specifically in an internal ANC conflict and structure. And we are seeing now, I think even more so, similar kinds of, of actions um, stemming from the so-called Nkandla crew and, the, and, the, and in and around the Zuma government, where the power of the state um, is being used to advance factional and sometimes economic interests. Um, and certainly, whereas that, uh, this is not a court of law, and I can't necessarily prove that, um, I think it's becoming apparent. Um, um, any glance through the press will give a sense of how this is happening. Mm. Um, the, so one of the biggest problems that we're falling down on is actually political, and how the political leadership, you know, the institutes are not, not bedded down. 19 years is not as long as you might think. And predatory individuals and elite groups are still able to use and, and avoid justice, for example, through those institutions to the detriment of all of our freedom. Are you saying then we're not being, uh, we're, we're not being uh, as said an example from the top? I want to put this to Kerwin now, Kerwin Laboni in the, in the, in the Joburg studio. Uh, Kerwin, you heard what Nick just said uh, now. It's almost it's saying in a, in a very politically correct way, the, the example from the top is not one that is um, exactly ideal. And in fact, what the, the movement towards a unified South Africa is actually coming from the, the man and woman on the street. Yes, most definitely. Uh, uh, people on the street uh, set a very good example. In fact, uh, the death of apartheid was brought, uh, what, uh, the book by our ch chief executive officer shows that the death of apartheid was brought about more by ordinary people than uh, uh, politicians and that they took advantage of what was already happening on the ground. Uh, our leadership, um, because of uh, contest for, for, for political office, uh, the leadership of the country, uh, I would agree with uh, the, our analyst that has really set a, rep, a bad example for, for, for uh, ordinary people to follow and that uh, in most instance, instances they've been very, very divisive. Looking at uh, race relations specifically now, which is obviously your area of expertise, uh, Cohen. When I go to a, a school day, I've got uh, I've got a daughter, a 16-year-old daughter at, at a school, and I I see the different races mixing, which is something that would have been unheard of 30, 40 years ago, maybe even uh, more recently than that. It's it seems to me that yes, the step in the right direction, but it's going to take two or three generations for previous preconceived prejudices prejudices to be completely broken down. Yes, and you can even see the example from uh, other countries in Europe. Uh, you can look at the French. Uh, there are, uh, what do you say, uh, there are, um, well, people do not, uh, you know, uh, there are uh, racial tensions uh, in Europe as well. Uh, in America, it, after 300 years or so of slavery, you still have racial tensions there as well. So we really, really, uh, in South Africa, uh, we are teenagers, as you say, uh, rightly point out, Lindsay. And we have a long way to go. Uh, gradually, we will get there. But uh, to to fix uh, racial tensions between uh, different population groups is really going to take a long time. It's a process. Uh, but the signs are, are really positive. Uh, people are, are, are living together, uh, both in affluent areas and in le less affluent areas. So there is there is movement uh, in the right direction in that regard. I think you're absolutely right. Nick, what about economic freedom uh, leading to more uh, socio-economic uh, harmony, yes. if you like? If people, are, if people are wealthy, I know this sounds a little bit trite, but if people are wealthy, they tend to be rather, uh, rather happy and they don't commit crime and therefore the, the racial tensions that we hear about so, so often and still so often uh, sort of disappear. I think you're completely right. If I can just juxtapose two mm. th things. I mean, I'm old enough to remember what South Africa was like mm. in the late 70s, for example, or what race relations, my, as a young white person's interaction with black people, was with 
never at best working class people um, in, 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 in seriously low socio socioeconomic positions. We've clearly had a huge burgeoning growth of the so-called black middle class. Yes, a lot of it's related to state employment. Um, yes, some of it's related to black economic empowerment. Um, but it's a lot of it's related to just allowing the human creativity, the removal of apartheid, the dam that apartheid had built, and to, uh, to, for that to grow and grow very, very rapidly. But, but then this is the other side. You go down to those beautiful restaurants that scatter around the coast, right where we are near, from the waterfront onwards, and you look across at who's being served and who's serving. Mm. There's a couple of ANC fat cats um, being served, um, but it's, it's white people across the board and the servers are all black. Well, this is Cape Town. I mean, I don't want to get too much into this now, but the Cape Town is inc incredibly misrepresentative. Cape that Town, the, the area you're talking about of, of South Africa. There are also a lot of tourists. So, uh, mm. yeah, I don't, I don't want to make mm. a shibboleth of it, but mm. I think we've got a long way to go, and the things that drive racial tensions are going to be with us for a long, long time. Yes, indeed. Kerwin, just we're going to wrap this up now with, with you, your final comments. Um, you, are, as we've both said together, we are still in the early stages of. Of, of transformation. We've made just giant strides, but there's some glaring uh, mistakes that we've made as well. What do you want to see for the next, uh, let's say when we're 21, we get out of our teenage phase, we, we come of age. What do you want to see over the next couple of years? Where do the gaps need to be plugged? Uh, really, the, the greatest challenge for South Africa is youth unemployment. Uh, if you can fix that, South Africa, I have no doubt, will be on a roll. You fix the youth, you get them jobs, you get them working, keep them off the streets, keep them off crime and drugs, and South Africa will be on the right track. Mm. Do you think that there is a whole lost generation, potentially, if the government doesn't get the unemployment rate down from its official 25%, whatever it is, uh, probably 35 to 45% youth unemployment? If they don't tackle that, then there is a whole lost generation who will say, I don't care, uh, whether it's apartheid or whether it's the ANC uh, uh, government's uh, failings, I've been failed in both instances. We have already seen the signs uh, from anecdotal evidence from uh, press reports. Uh, people who do not have a stake in the South African economy uh, will never uh, care uh, uh, you know, about investment, attract, uh, attracting foreign direct investment. They have no stake in South Africa, so they will try, uh, not try. Um, if they destroy the country uh, via their actions, it will not matter to them. You, you look at most protests. Um, whether it's for service delivery, education. It's a lot of young people, some of them under their, uh, under their teens, who are throwing stones at the police and taking part in these protests and looting shops. They have nothing to care about, about uh, our country because they have no stake uh, in the economy. The sooner you get them participating in the economy, the better for everyone concerned. Kerwin, thanks very much for your time this lunchtime. That's Kerwin Labone, who is researcher at the SA Institute of Race Relations. Uh, Nick, thanks very much for your time. Maybe just one very quick, very quick positive comment about Freedom Day. I, we have got so much to be proud of. Um, Freedom Day is, in, in terms of where the world has been in the last 50 years, South Africa and what happened that what we are celebrating on Freedom Day is one of the great human achievement, achievements of the last two or three hundred years.